Hello, everyone. It's Wednesday night, and that means it's once again time for the Writer's Room. I'm your co-host, Kat Rocha, the night editor, and with me, as always, is... Jay Ishiro Finney, author and alien in a human suit. And, and whoops, tonight we have William here in the room. Yes. Hi, everybody. I'm William Hastings. I'm the author of Vagabond Legacy, uh, a YA fantasy series that is all about uh, overcoming trauma and rebuilding your life. And I'm also the author of Vatican Championship Wrestling, a novel that is all about suplexing the devil into outer space. I am New Publishing's King of Pain, and I'm very happy to be back on the show. Damn straight. And hopefully a little later, Raltz will be joining us as well. But Mr. Bloodthorn right now has been caught trying to cross the border with a truck full of midget women. And uh, we don't know when we'll no, be I'm not again. <laughs> you know, I think they got three strikes for that. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, him and his midget ladies. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yes, you know, actually, he should do midget wrestling. Ooh, Dude. you know, there's 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 a, an untapped market right there. Oh man, I, I'd pay for that. <laughs> Damn straight. So, what is our topic for this evening? Okay, so like, if Windows crashes and destroys like two weeks' work of your writing, and the regular backup files that are supposed to be auto saved don't seem to be opening. Is there anything I can do other than shoot myself? You can shoot Bill Gates. Yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> in uh, Minecraft. Yeah. Play Minecraft. All right. No, that, we'll talk about that another day. Anyway, uh, what's up? No, what, what's the topic for tonight? Well, we are picking up where we left off about post-traumatic stress last week. Just to give you a recap, I gave you the long, harrowing experiences of when I was caught in a random shooting, was chased down by a nut, ran off the road, and he tried to kill my sister, a friend, and myself, and I took the bullet, and how that affected me in the long term. Now, I might talk a little bit more about that later, um, and maybe I'll talk about seeing Little Gray Men, too, while I'm at it, mm -hmm. and share a little bit of Utopiates, which was the other book where I really dug into post-traumatic stress in my writing, because uh, last week I talked about uh, scars. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we didn't really get to hear much of William last week. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, Ralts just had so many damn interesting stories about <laughs> being mentally ill and having post-traumatic stress. It, it was kind of hard not to. Yeah, I was pretty enraptured, to be honest. He, he, he had some fascinating things to say. So, um, for those who, again might not have heard last week's uh, episode or who may not be uh, familiar with you, uh, you know, since uh, I know you have been on this show a couple of times. Um, so you yourself don't have PTSD, but you have worked with a lot of people who have. Yes, that's correct. Um, if, if I did have PTSD, I wouldn't realize it because I'm not entirely sure you know what it what it looks like from the inside but i've seen it mm -hmm. in other people and um it's uh, been a big important part of my life and my writing um the uh the whole concept of vagabond legacy is based around that yeah cuz you have i know you have uh, at least no one two three four characters I'm thinking of off the top of my head, at least in uh, uh, Crimson Spark, that um, have gone through some uh, some rough things and are working through it. Uh, I don't think I'm missing anybody. Yes, in Spark, um, particularly the two protagonists, uh, mm -hmm. each of whom have chapters that are from their perspective, are dealing with um, very severe trauma, both of which... Um, you know, but their trauma gets revealed over the course of the story. Um, but it generally has to do with them living in a in a society that treats children as disposable property and how they are sort of processing through that together. Um, book two is going to introduce two more protagonists, each suffering from different kinds of of a similar uh, trauma that is more internal. You know, well, I'm gonna have um, I'm gonna have characters that are struggling with. Thing with, with relating to their family because they aren't um, they aren't dealing with their own condition well. 
I'm going to have characters who are um, who have trauma in the past, and it, because of that, they spiral and they wind up in more unhealthy relationships, and uh, it it sort of goes out of control from there because um, they've been wounded once, and it's you know blood in the water, mm -hmm. and uh, there's going to be a lot of stuff like that. It's going to deal with some pretty heavy stuff, but uh, I am happy to say that Vagabond Legacy is um, also a very entertaining series. Um, very uh classical um fantasy kind of writing and it is also uh not explicit so you can give it to pretty much any young adult in your life and they can uh walk away with either a good story or an interesting uh perspective real quick hi ralt hey. glad you could join us i just got up and happened to wander in the front room i'm lazy <laughs> All right, the party is going to start now because the uh, the master of the midgets is here, yeah. Yeah. and and our listener GDC thought we were joking. No, no, he really does have a history with sexy midgets. Yes, the a sexy midget, a sexy midget, and some of her friends. <laughs> <laughs> well, nothing like that. I mean, like hanging out and drinking with him and barbecuing, and that still you know. sounds fun. It is. Very nice. So what uh, I miss. Um, William's been telling us about um, his book series and ah. uh, you know, about the um, reasons why he wrote this. And I was actually going about to ask, um, are you willing to share some stories? Because I know a lot of the characters are based on you know real people that you have uh, that you have known and you have worked with are you willing to share any information or any stories i understand uh, if you don't feel comfortable because these are other people that that um you've been talking to i, I wouldn't say based on um but uh, there there is a lot of uh, inspiration that i took from oh. from the work that i did um a lot of these the the uh skeleton of these characters have been with me kind of forever but the um the meat of them comes from the stuff I learned from my job. And, um, you know, I've, I have met people that fit the role, fit uh, the archetype that you're seeing in the story. I've met uh, girls that dress like boys because something really bad happened to them. I've met uh, people who have dead twins and uh, therefore have uh, really bad attachment issues. You know, these are, these are things that exist in the world and, um, but I, I wasn't seeing them in YA, uh, at least not in the way that I wanted them to come across. You know, I was seeing it sort of watered down, I guess you could say, um, mm -hmm. or or sort of shut out completely. Um, and I, I wanted to write something that was really um, that was that was age appropriate, was still very very real. You know, that didn't talk down to the reader, and um, that was sort of the impetus for where Vagabond Legacy comes from. Nice. I guess. <laughs> Either way. <laughs> I mean, good, good that you had uh, some references and everything and, and that you didn't try to talk down because I always hated that when I was you know, young. Yeah, the worst, days. the worst kids books are the one like books for young people that talk down to them are the worst. And the worst, actually, you know, the worst are books for adults that are, um, that talk down to them, which we see a lot of these days. But, you know, young people hate it even more. No, definitely, especially with the uh, the subject matter. I'm sorry, you were about to say something? Oh, I just said I've turned the channel or set books down because uh, the author decided I was functionally mentally disabled and could barely read English. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I have too. But I've also, I've also put books down because they were – so explicit that the the emotional message wasn't resonating with me as a reader ah. and uh i really wanted to avoid that and um because i overall this is just a personal opinion of mine but i do think ya is a little bit too explicit generally and i wanted um i wanted to avoid that and i think i succeeded according to um the reviews i, I succeeded it's kind of funny the way they treat YA now. I mean, I was in seventh grade. I don't know. I was, was it, I was in, I think I was in junior high when they assigned First Blood to us. And, you know, uh, 
God, it was sixth grade that I read of Mice and Men as part of class, and now they act like, you know, if these, if these children read anything bad or any kind of struggle, they're going to burst into flame. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You, um, you have really two sides of an extreme. You have people who don't want you to write anything bad happening to characters, and you have people that want you to write every horrible, gory, uh, explicit detail to them. Either. Misery and, and, uh, yeah, it's exactly, recorded. exactly, exactly, and and that both of those are huge turnoffs to readers. Yeah, I hate misery porn, and I don't like people saying, "Oh, you should write misery porn because that's the real human experience." And it's like, no, it's I'm not. sorry, no, it's not. <laughs> there's there's nothing to be gained in a story from wallowing in misery. the 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 stuff you take away from is the development and the transformation out of trauma and and learning to deal with the trauma and grow and and put your life back together. And that's what uh, my stories are about. Uh, Well, my experience has been with people who deal with extreme trauma is they come in two breeds. There are those who let the post-traumatic stress or the trauma rule them. They like being broken. They like what the way people treat them. They like the special considerations. They like playing the victim card. But if you stay in that point of trauma and never leave, you've stopped maturing and developing as an individual. You will remain that same person for the rest of your life. You will stop emotionally aging at that point. Oh, I've seen that. Your life just ends. Like I said, I have two uncles that never left Vietnam, ever. And I have two other uncles that, you know, they struggled with it and didn't come out of it until the late 80s, but they got out of it. But the two that never left Vietnam destroyed their lives. They never had a normal functioning life. No family, no real friends they could keep. They couldn't keep jobs. And they just couldn't keep going. And I watched it destroy them. Yeah. And and people think that's admirable. And no, it's not. My uncle, my, everything my uncle could have been was gone. Um, in in my writing, I, I, I refer to tra- trauma as uh, like shackles around the mind. And I use um, slavery in the real in the in the, in the context of the story uh, to contrast the the internal slavery of the characters because they are at, when the story starts, they are as as you said, Rolf, they're sort of slaves to their trauma. They don't know how to break out of this cycle it's they're letting it define them and rule them and it's only by coming together and working through it that they are able to to become full people the other thing is there's no quick fixes and everybody wants there to be i mean i still struggle with it it's been 30 years (laughs) (laughs) that is one thing i've noticed now maybe it's just because my family were assholes but their inability to grasp that this is lifelong yeah, this is probably the best I'm going to get, but it's never going away. I mean, I got slowly better over the years, especially medication therapy. But I mean, I took I took part in some horrific fucking shit. They had me so doped up for one of the one of the behaviors that I actually could not remember what month it was. I uh, didn't oh, get, wow. ever get it that bad unless Kat disagrees. The worst I ever got it was. They had me on enough Zoloft that I just didn't give a shit about anything anymore. It's like, well, I, you know, I could hang out with friends, but, you know, I could stay home and just sit here. Yeah, they had me on Propranolol, Seroquel. And like, oh, God, Seroquel. That's bad. Oh, I'm still on Seroquel. I'm still on 1,000 milligrams of Seroquel a day. Oh, wow. 500 at night, 250 in the morning, 250 at noon. Wow. Uh, I, I have I had a bad reaction to Seroquel, so um, yeah. Story if for it another works, time. if it works for you, that's great. <laughs> really, it's a terrible bipolar medication, an amazing fucking PTSD medication. Oh, well, there you go. My my doctor was an asshole then. <laughs> of course, I think I, my doctor thought that I was a, a schizophrenic. So, oh God, uh, I actually have a schizophrenic in my family, and they take Seroquel, and they take. 500 milligrams a day, and it worked wonders. I mean, no hallucinations anymore. But, you know, if you weren't actually schizophrenic and they gave it to you, yeah, it's going to screw you up. Yeah, they gave it to me as a sleep aid. Oh, God. Yeah. Um, 
I hate that doctor, but that's a story for another day. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, they had me so checked up on this. I couldn't remember what day it was. I was like, I my family members. When I came out of the therapy and came up to our regimen, everything was completely different. They used it to smooth the memories down, basically, so I couldn't get them. And between that and, you know, Vic, <laughs> it made it so I could continue. But I mean, it discontinued it because it didn't work for about three quarters of the people. <laughs> it just burnt their brain. Jeez. Actually, that is a great um, uh, topic to bring up because, you know, especially with, you know, classic writers like Philip K. Dick um, and then definitely moving into modern day, we are coming across a lot of protagonists who are on medication and any insights or advice you can share to our listeners on writing a character who is <laughs> medicated so that it doesn't come off as stupid because it it does and i've come across that <laughs> oh god the coming down off the medication is terrible but there's two sides of it if you know my brother he's got ptsd and if he comes if he's is taken off his medication uh he's pretty much you know seizures the whole nine yards and he's miserable and can barely function but if i go off my medication i start to feel good and i start to feel real good and then i feel really good and then nothing can stop me <laughs> oh it ramps you up into a mania that's why they give me circles because my PTSD got me stuck in mania. I did. I, oh. I dropped down to depression. I was at about a normal person, forty-eight to seventy-two hours awake, eight to twelve hours of sleep, right back to forty to seventy-two hours, and so I feel better and better and better. <laughs> and uh, your mood swings, mood swings get terrible for some people. You know, because I know quite a few people that are medicated. Their mm -hmm. mood swings get terrible. Um, Sometimes the flashbacks come back. Uh, your hands shake when you come off the medication. Um, maybe you can't eat right. Um, God, it's the side effects of coming off of some of the stuff is terrible. Some of the stuff, believe it or not, if I was to quit Seroquel, I'd have to go to the hospital. They'd have to put, they'd have to intake me and watch me because by about day three without my medication, I started to get nosebleeds. Oh, jeez. And they flat out told me, you've been on it for over 10 years. You come off of it, it might kill you. Oh, geez. And they're they're talking like if you were to like quit tomorrow cold turkey? Because I know yep. some it's you can be weaned off or is it they know this is a lifelong thing? This is a lifelong thing. They, can, they might be able to wean me off of it, but they're worried they won't be able to find something to replace it. And it's to the point, you know, yeah, that, replacing medication can be rough though. Like uh, uh, the, the, the jump between one med to another, like I I've been through that and that is a nightmare. Oh, when they were trying to find out what worked for me, they gave me uh, well, they gave me, uh, they gave me something. I think it was like Prozac or something. And it turned me into a raving asshole. Axel. Paxil. They gave me Paxil and it turned me into a raving oh, asshole. Oh, Paxil's a nasty drug. Oh, it made me mean. And then they gave me another one and Okay, I have never been suicidal. Even in that hospital room, I wasn't suicidal. I've never been suicidal in my life. Within 48 hours of taking this drug, my friends I was talking to online was like, I, I'm going to call you on your cell phone, and I want you to do what I'm going to say. I'm like, all right, all right. I just feel, I think I'm just, I think I'm just done with life. And he got me on the phone. He walked me all the way to the ER. <laughs> oh, geez. <laughs> because it uh, made me suicidal. You know, Fizz, Fizz Chozo makes an interesting point in, in the chat. He says, my father always says using pharmaceutical drugs to cure mental illnesses never works. And in, in a way, you are you are absolutely correct. I advocate very much for the use of of good good um, good uh, ways of treating your, your mental illnesses. But they are just treatments. They're not making it go away. You know, it's important to process through where it comes from. You know, I've been on I've been on antidepressants and anxiety medication uh, longer than I haven't. And, uh, you know, it, it isn't enough, you know, you need to, you need to reach through and find where it's coming from. It, your best case scenario, your meds allow you to be who you would have been without the damage. Yes. That's a good way of putting it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's still damage under there. I mean, I still get the shakes. Uh, once in a while, I'll have a bad reaction to something, 
but by and large, shakes. what? I hate the shakes. Oh God. Um, Seroquel gives you sugar cravings. I mean, that's why Ooh, a lot of people think Seroquel are fat. I mean, I can slug down, you know, the big giant monsters. I can slug down mm -hmm. three or four of those in a day with no effect. Do you guys ever get body shocks? Oh, where you suddenly just jerk? Yeah, yeah. Where your whole like your whole nervous system just like what? Oh yeah, I hit the ground. Oh. Yeah, I got that after. Yeah, I got that. Uh, I started getting that about three months after I was in the hospital. My body. A lot of the times like, that reset. could be like a, with, a withdrawal syndrome too. So if you're switching medication. Um, oh no no! This was happening even before where I'd have a uh, panic reaction or a uh, uh, PTS reaction, and I would get the weird psychological. It's not physical. It's it's a mental pain that starts in your head, and you can feel that lightning chill shoot right down your spine, and then you can feel the nerves across your rib cage all start to get kind of like hot but cold and chill, and then cramps start forming in your stomach, and your legs don't want to work anymore, and you double over and hit the ground. Not because you want to, but because nothing's holding you up. I haven't had that happen. Okay. I get where I'll be, I'll be laying there in bed, and I'll just suddenly full body jerk. And it's like my body going, uh, are we still in the hospital? <laughs> oh, geez. It's like I'm being kicked in the chest to wake me back up. And I talked oh. to the doctor, and he said it's, 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 from, it's from the trauma I took. I don't doubt it. Oh, wow. But, you know, because mainly, you know, it, and it comes out in all kinds of ways. And, you know, they never really show it. They always, God, I hate TV. I hate movies that they show mental illness. I mean, it's always, you know, cured by the most ridiculous shit. Or it's so over the top. It's it's bordering on satirical comedy. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's a wacky. It's a... If you can you're lucky if you get like robin williams basically usually yeah. you get uh jim carrey <laughs> but you know they always show bipolar as oh i'm a little sad today oh i'm a little happy today <laughs> i've seen bipolar destroy people's lives oh my gosh there's this really yeah. uh, you know of course i don't remember the title of it now but there is this really famous novel about a woman who's married to a bipolar man who will just freak out and pretend that he's a bat or something ridiculous like that and just it's disappear for like four days. That's bipolar yeah. cycling up into yeah. psychosis. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I forget no. what it was, called, but it, it was something. Um, but anyway, Kat, uh, your question about writing medication. Um, I uh, Obviously, my books take place a million, billion years ago, so there's a whole ton of antidepressants or antipsychotics going around. But um, two recent examples uh, in, in fiction that I saw that really I thought were done well, where we talked a little bit about um, Rambo last time in, in, mm -hmm. in this chat. And the new, the new Rambo film, Last Blood, the, the one that just came out, he's, oh, been on, um, he's been on antipsychotics or whatever you want to call them for, for 10 years. And it, it's evened him out. But he, what he, the way he describes it is very interesting. He says it, it just kind of puts a lid on things. And and I thought that that was really eloquent. And uh, if you haven't seen that movie, I recommend it because it's it's very emotional and uh, feels very true to the character. Um, but also, um, very recently, uh, Joker, Joaquin Phoenix in, in Joker. One of the whole things with him is that he's you know on all this medication that isn't really helping him, and then all of a sudden it just all stops. Yeah. Actually, yes, I was very impressed by. Uh... Uh, by that by that portrayal see i don't i don't really have to i don't really use medication that much in the books because it, there's nanites and there's psychic surgery because some of the races are psychic and there's there's advanced therapies because it's eight thousand years after the glassing of earth you know it's like 10 it's like eight it's like nine thousand ten thousand years from now so their approach to therapy is completely different i have a guy who's addicted to power armor He's literally addicted to power armor with attachment disorders to it. And, you know, I treated it more like he was an alcoholic or, you know, he went to therapy. He can't be near the, he can't be near the armor. He can't be near, be near any power armor. He can't be near a nano forge. And, you know, he's dealing with the, he's dealing with the longing he's got toward it, toward he needs it. And it's still, he doesn't have to take medication. It just, you know, it's therapy and, you know, basically psychic work on him 
So it's I treat it a lot differently because I've got a, access to high enough technology that's basically magic. <laughs> but he doesn't really recover because, you know, <clears throat> he's always going to be addicted to that armor. He was in it for thirty five years straight. Security and, blanket. Yeah, it has a it has a female voiced VI that interacts uh, basically psychically with you with, at, after a couple months. So you become massively addicted to it with attachment disorders. It's called operator identification syndrome. And, you know, he's got to deal with it. Well, you know, being in an indestructible suit with a very comforting female voice talking to you at all times, I can see the attraction. Yeah. You know, and then 35 years where you're wearing it, never getting out of it, combat the whole time, because even while you're asleep, the suit can run off your subconscious. So that's really? all I knew for 35 years. <laughs> it makes sense in the context. Mm -hmm. No, it sounds cool. Yeah, you know, and then I've got then I've got somebody who's so mentally damaged she voluntarily entered a nunnery because she felt she was dangerous to everybody else. You know, I, even with all this magic, there's no instant quick cures. It's the hum It's the it's a living person's brain, and living brains are incredibly complex. Which is kind of why I'd quit. They try. I would kind of wish they'd quit trying to screw with them online and through media. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, do we have questions? Um, actually, uh, there was one from Wolf, and he asked, uh, "How do uh, you all feel about PTSD played as a joke?" Don't care. I like that one episode of Seinfeld where Mr. Costanza uh, flashes back to Korea, but not combat in Korea. Like, he served bad food and everybody got sick. <laughs> so he won't cook anymore. I thought that was pretty funny. Uh, airplane, uh, <laughs> hot shots. I oh, mean, I've got no problem when it's obviously over the top and played for laughs. You know, then it's kind of funny. Because if I can't laugh at it, what the hell am I doing? I mean, I really enjoyed the, uh, see if anyone even remembers, the uh, show Der Wonder Shows in. Where they had the one scene where it's a kid saying, you're never too young for a nom flashback. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, the the boomers practically gave all of Gen X nom flashbacks with just God constantly harping about it. <laughs> mm. Dad, you were a hippie. You didn't have any nom flashbacks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Your but, stress I mean, was whether, away, whether or not you were going to run off to Canada. Yeah, the played as a joke when it's obviously a joke and it's in like a comedy show doesn't bother me. I mean, I love Airplane. That movie's funny. What bothers me is that is when it's not played as a joke, but it's it's funny. Yeah, you or know, like supposed... when 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 it's done so poorly that it becomes hilarious. And um, I can't think of this. The only thing that I can think of off the top of my head, Cat, uh, you'll maybe appreciate this. Is uh, mm -hmm. Life is Strange. Oh, my freak. Yeah. <laughs> I never played that game. It just didn't appeal to me. I didn't no. either. I actually uh, watched Kat's review of the comics, and she sort of explained it to me. But the character's trauma in that is so cartoonishly, like, justified, I guess you they could say. They murder an entire <laughs> town that includes their parents, and we're supposed to feel bad for them that they had to relocate. I heard about the ending of that where you can let your friend die because she's a complete loser douche who caused everything to happen or you can save them and let the town die. Yeah. Yeah. And I heard that the majority of people chose to save their friend. Uh, uh. I got, it, actually, it's harsher than that. The majority of female players chose to save their friend. The majority of male players chose to save the town. Interesting. So if you have a moral decision, pick the man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah, it's I mean, basically, it's basically B, uh, BPD the game. One thing I don't like is when you have smarmy characters, like in a sitcom, who then make a character with PTSD the butt of the joke. Yeah. Oh, that happens in comic books all the time. Where, That's right. Uh, you know, there'll be some, uh, you know, uh, some one of the Avengers or something will be talking about how. You know, we, we need to do this or else this will happen and it's really important. And then somebody, you know, it's usually, you know, it's usually, um, it's usually Tony Stark and he's usually getting shot down by one of the uh, 10 billion diversity hires. 
on the Avengers yeah. these days, um, undermining you know what what the character has been through and uh, how they've grown and changed. And it's um, it's not just in comic books. Obviously, it's in everywhere. That was just the only example I can think of. Well, a good head. example is the movies. Tony fucking drank for fucking three movies, and nobody did shit. I mean, yeah. his art power was practically chasing him down the street with an axe, and nobody did anything. Not even Cap. Not even Cap went, hey, uh, Tony, why don't we go to the VA, dude? <laughs> you know, nobody brought that up. To, nobody brought that up to Cap that, you know, he's from the 40s, you know. <laughs> but, yeah. Oh, they... sorry. Just to pass her by, that's a really good point. I never huh. – uh, yeah, the, the main – the character from Independence Day, Randy Quaid's character – who gets abducted by aliens and is like really traumatized by the experience and everybody just kind of laughs it off like oh you're Andy you're so crazy uh, and then it turns out that it's 100% true and he winds up sacrificing himself to save all of mankind i, I never thought about it that way but that's that's a really interesting perspective on that character uh, yeah but yeah there's the media never does any good media doesn't do anything good but softcore porn and feeling sorry for themselves I mean, are we media? Uh, we can be if we're not careful. <laughs> I mean, I'm talking about the modern like TV movies. I mean, I've seen like a handful of good movies in the past oh, like five years. Trenton, yeah. Trenton Arnie in the chat says one of the best series exploring PTSD is Violet Evergarden. Yes, Violet Evergarden is 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 a straight up I would go so far as to say it's probably one of the best anime series. Um I've ever seen it's it's an incredible exploration of, of uh, dealing with life after a war. Um, Isn't that the one and, where, th where it starts as a maid or a typist? I think I've seen like one. Yes, episode. and she doesn't have hands. Or no, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, she doesn't have hands. It's very compelling and very sad and really well done. Yeah, I watched one episode and haven't gotten back to that. Got another question for us? Hello. Hello. Oh, <laughs> did we lose them? I think we might have. Oh, okay. Let me. Uh, let's see. I'll find. I'll find us a question. Right. Um, yeah, so I'm in the. You're room. muted. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, say, I'm on the back porch again because I sit back here when I talk about stuff like this, so I can smoke because you're not allowed to smoke in the house. So I'd well, exiled no. to the back porch like like an unwanted, untouchable. Well, again, I'll repeat. The thing that really annoys the ever-living shit out of me is the uh, millennial and now Zoomer concept of what post-traumatic post stress is. Oh, my God. All these people said I was a horrible person and ripped on me on Twitter. I'm scared. No, shut up. <laughs> shut the fuck up. Well, you know, look, you know. If that was enough to give you long-term post-traumatic stress... Do us all a favor and shoot yourself. People who do that aren't traumatized. They're they have they have a very different disorder, and they are attempting to garner sympathy. Yeah, I actually heard something really interesting. I read a paper about how uh, what it is is it's a reflection of what happened when Gen X got old enough to have kids. If you remember your history, Gen X gets old enough to have kids, and all of a sudden, all these new laws were made. You know, you know, remember, the boomers didn't care if we played on construction equipment and fell on our heads. They didn't mm -hmm. care. But all of a sudden, we start having kids, and there's all these laws that start getting put in place. You know, they remove the gravel and add wood chips. They remove the wood chips and add rubber chips. They get rid of the monkey bars. They get rid of this. They get rid of that. And so what you had was starting about 1995, all of these kids are wrapped in cotton. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. they, they're not allowed to experience any form of emotions at all. Any any extreme emotions, they're not allowed to deal with. You know, they don't get it. The world is made entirely safe. The TV and TV shows are watered down to absolute crap. You had 90s cartoons, which were some of the worst pablum I have ever seen. I mean, they were worse than the Smurfs. And these kids went through life, and they're completely wrapped. They became adults, and when they became adults... There was more laws. To, they had more protections. And then the war on terror happened. And unlike what everybody thought, it didn't – I'm going to say it, it. The war on terror did not affect the majority of Americans. The majority of Americans had no idea what was even going on. 
There was no tax hikes. There was no rationings. Eventually, CNN stopped even showing it. You never heard. You, you never turned on the news and saw the latest battle in Afghanistan and Iraq like, you know, you saw for Vietnam where every fucking night it was another battle. You never saw that. So it didn't affect America. So it didn't affect them. Most of these most of these people were, you know, 17, 18 when the two towers fell and they were shielded from it. You know, anybody who was a teenager was largely shielded from the towers dropping and what it meant. And so they become adults and they enter the real world and the real world doesn't like you. The universe is malevolent and will take everything from you and laugh while it's doing it. And so it kept poking these people, but they had ways of coping. They could, you know, they could run away and hide. And according to this, what happened is instead of building up the calluses that that actually a lot of America, a lot of people do build up, especially in other countries, uh, non-Western countries, these people have calluses like our generation got calluses because, come on, we all saw the girl fall off the fall off the monkey bars and bust her head open and she never came back. OK, she busted mm -hmm. her skull open and oatmeal hit the ground and she never came back. We all saw it. And but these kids were wrapped up in the Western world. And they never saw any hardship at all. You know, the, we're not talking about your average. We're talking about the part that does the most screaming. Yeah. You know, the 5% the of people online, they see well, something and it traumatizes them because they finally get an emotional reaction on something and they have no idea how to deal with it. Well, you know, speaking as one of those kids that was bubble wrapped, you know, I was born in, I was born in 1992. Um, yeah. So, um, I, I was part of that generation and I was talking to my friend uh, recently about why, why do you think millennials are so, are so fucked up? And yeah. um, she said, well, we watched 3000 people die on TV when we were eight years old. And I didn't even think about that because, you know, it, it's become such a thing of life now, but then you see these, you're yeah. bubble wrapped and then things start picking at it and you start seeing the, the horrible dark parts of the world and you don't know how to process it. And it, it, it eventually breaks you down. Like, you know, I, you know, when I was, um, I don't mean to go into my own history or whatever, but when I was in high school, I had a complete mental breakdown and had to drop out and get all these tests done. And it was, and it was, it was rough. And I think it was largely because I didn't know how to process all this, all the horrible shit that was happening. And a lot of parents didn't give their kids tools to process it. So they don't know how to deal with emotions. I had somebody telling me that, you know, oh, I hate this movie because it, it gives it traumatizes me. And I'm like, well, you know, what movie is it? I mean, it's a horrible movie. You know, she's like, and they're like, well, I really need to watch it because, you know, I'm supposed to do an assignment on it for my theater class. I'm like, well, what fucking horrible movie Unless is this? Unless it's sallow, you know. <laughs> Apocalypse Now. Really? I love Apocalypse Now. I oh, watched I that for fun. And she literally could not process the bridge scene. Where, where they go up at the bridge at night and they're, you know, she didn't like the the, the flagrant use of the end world and everybody looks so frightened and confused. Everybody you know, was frightened and confused. It's a, it's a movie about Vietnam. Yeah. And she looks at me, she goes, how can you handle this? I was like, um, it's a movie and I've seen worse. <laughs> yeah. And she was like, what, you know, oh, you, you know, it just makes me aware that these people are killing each other. I'm like, well, yeah, it's war. I'm sorry, sweetie, it's war. And she I, literally had no concept of how to deal with this because her parents didn't give her the tools to do it, and her teachers didn't, and her and no, nobody did. Nobody gave her the tools to process that people kill each other. Yeah, you know, and I think that was one of the things that helped me um, break out of 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 the padding. You know, was was finding these these films and these books that that didn't talk down to you that were you know, dark and real and about the horrible things that you see in the world and it, exposing myself to that stuff on mass created kind of like, I don't know, white blood cells almost that helps me out when things were the worst. Well, I think uh, another thing that a lot of people overlook, and it's, uh, I only have these facts in my head because I've been researching it for what I've been writing is that uh, I'll, I'll say it again and again and again, you know, these crazy laws that, as Rawls put it, all started happening when Gen X started having kids. That wasn't what was fueling it, though. Because the thing is, apparently, despite all the teen sex we were having, we didn't really produce a lot of children. And no, we in practiced general, safe sex. In mm -hmm. fact, in general, Gen X didn't 
really produce a lot of kids. And when we started, it was usually late in life. Um, millennials started getting born when most, most Gen Xers were still in high school in the 80s. And um, so really, most or a huge chunk of the millennials were those second chance babies that uh, the boomers were like, well, we fucked up the first two. We fucked yeah. up this one. We neglected them. We were out doing our divorces and drinking and pretending or, we're not old. Or I'm on my uh, second or third marriage. I need to have another kid with this one. And now we're going to do it right in the 90s. Yes. Uh, Barney God. and participation awards. You know what? Barney was not that bad because I actually sat and watched it with my kids. Yeah. Teletubbies was not that bad. You know what? I'll give credit to Barney. Barney would let me take an hour nap in the afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> The Teletubbies that let me take a nap in the morning. <laughs> Good to go. I actually don't have a problem with the Teletubbies. Barney, I mean, at I least we weren't afraid that they were it's teaching. Elmo. At least we weren't afraid of like those children's cartoons in the nineties, like injecting, you know, sex and uh weird You talking Ren and Stimpy? <laughs> no, no, not really. I'm talking about like, you know, well, we all knew Ren and Stimpy was for adults. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, I, I mean, like, sh shows for kids back then are not like shows for kids now where you're getting nope. this kind of injection of propaganda with every bite. I mean, they'll, they'll point to G.I. Joe and go, oh, they were getting propaganda there. Uh, yeah, war sucks and terrorists are going to kill you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was like the G.I. Joe cartoon is like, it's like war in the same sense that like Star Wars is war. Yeah. Like, it, it's, it's laser beams and, and you know, giant robots and and stuff like that. I stand by that I was raised by Batman because the Batman cartoon gave you morals. It did show you how ugly humanity could be. Um, it also told you how to uh, treat your fellow man. And Batman was the best dad in the whole wide world. <laughs> <laughs> Batman gave us more morals than mom and dad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It was it was funny. I mean, and it was weird because they came out with all these laws, you know, at the time, you know, me and my wife made a decision because we all knew when we were kids, we all knew the people with old parents and parents in their, you know, everybody thinks, oh, I'll wait till I'm in my late 30s, early 40s to have kids. You have fucked that kid up because their parents can't do anything. They're old. They're tired. You know, I, mm -hmm. I used to get up. I used to get up on Saturday and Sunday morning and take my kids to the park and shit so my wife could sleep in. And we would run around and do shit till like three o'clock in the afternoon, come home. The kids are all asleep in the car covered with grass and grass stains. <laughs> and, you know, all my friends are like, oh, you shouldn't have your kids so early. So by the time I was 30, my kids were all, you know, either graduated or graduating. And no, it wasn't 30. No, it was a uh, 40. 40. By the time I was 40, by the time my friends have like five year olds, my youngest is a teenager and is pretty much self-sufficient. My oldest is graduated. I mean, my kids were all graduated and somebody I knew was 44 and was like, oh, we decided to have our first kid. And after 18 rounds of in vitro, we had one. And look, we have a baby. Well, it's 10 years later. And he died of a heart attack and she's too fucking tired to get to do anything with this kid. <laughs> and it blows me away that, you know, I'm sorry, if you have if you wait till you're 40s to have a kid, that's fucking child abuse. You have no energy. You have no interest. You can't learn new things. You're not interested in standing there and staring at the kid, you know, telling you this long rambling story for four hours about ghosts, the cat and Superman. You know, <laughs> you, you can't take him to the park. You don't have the spontaneity to deal with it. And I've never, you know, very rarely do you see somebody who had their kids in their late 30s, early 40s who raised well-adjusted kids. So uh, what you're telling me is I've got I've got. Uh... 10 years left pretty much yeah your clock's <laughs> ticking buddy <laughs> not to mention your balls are gonna go sour oh no start shooting waterheads <laughs> but you know i mean how many people do you know that how many people do you remember from your childhood that their parents were old my, I mean, we're not uh, my, parent old. my roommate in college um his parents were were very like really old like they were in their 60s Oh, Jesus. Uh, yeah, no, he was like something out of the Bible. Like he was born when his mother was like 55 or something. I had a friend where it's the same thing. They thought that she was way past her uh, 
her bearing years and uh nope you got a kid now they had had three already so you know and those kids were already grown and and either in college or out of the house so yeah he was a uh, he was a surprise yeah so their siblings are all grown-ass adults with their own marriages and mortgages and stuff it can be a very strange experience and he was kind of a weird guy i mean i love him to death but he i think he'd admit it too that he was kind of a strange guy Oh, menopause will do that. I mean, you know, we're over 50. Every once in a while, my wife will be like, oh, so my so my body found an egg to kick down there. Aren't I lucky? It's been six months. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Thanks for that. <laughs> but I mean, uh, you know, they, they had, you know, you're right. Ishi, they had these kids late in life and they were like, oh, we're not going to repeat how we fucked up our first three. <laughs> So we're going to pass laws and we're going to change the school system because now we can finally be asked to pay attention to something besides ourselves. And so they fucked them up. (laughs) Well, actually, okay, there is eight years difference between myself and my brother. I was born in 82. He was born in 90 Um, and uh, from my stepmother and uh, his childhood was totally different than mine because you know me you know you know uh avocado green shag carpeting wooden furniture it didn't matter if i you know fell down it's like i'll put myself back up you know you know dust the baby off you're fine uh yeah i split my head open on the furniture once and had three stitches no that's fine you know you know it's good you know you know kids bounce they're fine my brother, no, everything had to be, you were talking wrapped in bubble wrap. Everything was wrapped in rubber. Um, if it couldn't be glued down, it couldn't be in the house. Um, I, and yeah, just everything was baby proof. No. That was the word, the baby proof. Those stupid plastic things that you put on door handles so that he couldn't accidentally wander into the street. Oh. You know. But to be fair, if you had given your brother a fork, that did not have a cork on the tip. He he point, he poke himself in the eye. Mm, that's a or in story. an electrical socket, maybe. <laughs> my oldest yeah. sister is fifteen years older than me. My youngest sister is thirteen years younger than me. Oh my! My dad was married twice. And it's like, what the fuck was the matter with you? <laughs> uh, mine was four times. Uh, mm. I've got a, yeah. Multiple mine's, on, mine's on mine's on his second but he's he's gonna be he'll be getting there soon but i mean yeah and it led to all kinds of fucked up shit i mean something happened you know mm-hmm. i i maintain this i talked about it once in a psychology class when i was taking a couple of college courses and something happened in 1991 and i can't put my finger on it i can't i don't have a name for it but uh, it's like when the it's like when the Cold War ended, something snapped in the West psyche. Well, you know when you when you run out of enemies, uh, most groups will turn in on themselves. It was just really weird. I mean, we were on the edge of something great, and then in the late nineties, we pissed it away, and in the early two thousands, it just got blown out of the water. And it wasn't just America; it was everybody did it. And it was like this group psychosis. Well, from my perspective, because again, I was uh, I was ten in ninety two. Um, <laughs> we had we had Clinton, and Clinton made everything wonderful and safe, and there was nothing really to be worried about anymore. All the wars were gone. Um, you know, you can hear the sarcasm, but. Uh, <laughs> People believe that. People actually believe that. People are startled when I'm like, uh, me and my friends spent the entire 90s fighting brush fire wars. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and I knew that because of my dad's work at the time. Um, But yes, stateside, everybody wasn't looking for war. Everybody had this idea from my person, from from what I remember, that everything was fine. So that allowed them to look at other things like X Files and and uh, conspiracy theories, and it was it was really a distraction from the reality that was going on. Uh, I I found it was a it was a you know here's a shiny bobble to look at because what's actually happening is just we you don't want to deal please, with. Please please ignore all the men, women, and children that we burned to death in Waco. 
Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Oh God. Uh, yeah, I don't talk about that because you can actually see me on footage. <laughs> oh, are you serious? You were there. Yes. Yes. Oh my. Uh, they got the ammunition and the tear gas off of Fort Hood. Oh, geez. <laughs> yeah, I was watching. A, I was watching a. Uh, th it was like a thirty-year thing they were doing on it, or twenty-five-year thing, and I was like, "Oh fuck, I'm still in that." Because my daughter went, "That's you." I was like, "No, it's not." Yes, She's like, I know what you look like. <laughs> She's accusing you of war crimes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, pfft. you know, I'll tell you what. It was a hell of a lot different from being on the ground than everybody picking a, picking it apart afterwards. But I just did my job. I just showed up, handed out the ammo, and fucking left. <laughs> That's it wasn't my problem. Dude. It wasn't my problem. It was the FBI's fuck up, and I like I didn't like the FBI, and I didn't like the ATF, and I told them that to their face. Well, that's nice, at least. Yeah, you know, uh, if you've if you've read Spark, you know that I kind of have kind of a fascination with that event, and it, it's mm -hmm. echoed in Spark, and it's echoed in Embers. Um, it's a lot of um, just kind of weird aspects of American culture made it into this weird fantasy novel set in the Mediterranean. I mean, it was startling when I found out how it ended because I was like, "Oops, <laughs> well, that screwed the pooch." Yeah, yeah I didn't. You know, I didn't Clinton find out about it until I was uh, like, I didn't find out until I was out of college. Like, I, I never, I never knew anything about it. What'd you well, say? Again, she... Hillary Clinton wanted it ended early because they were going to have this great announcement about the Bosnian War, and they didn't want that as a distraction. Oh, Bosnia! There was a fuck up and a half. <laughs> Let's get involved. Let's get involved in an ethnic fucking war that goes back 800 years and nobody knows yeah. what the fuck's going on anymore. Oh, great! So I'm standing around this fucking camp and I got no idea. What fuck, nobody knows what we're supposed to be fucking doing. Oh, drive down to the gas station and back. Well, that's a wonderful thing. I'm sure that'll be peace on earth. Man, I'm that's in that's Bosnia. Up there. Yes. Oh, Bosnia blue. It was stupid too. And what I love is I love looking online. It says American troops were not, on Wikipedia and everything. Everybody's like, oh, American troops weren't deployed to Bosnia until 1995, 1996. And it's like, bullshit. First Cavalry went there in 1992 and they moved elements of 8th Infantry and 5th Corps into Bosnia in 1992. And is late that right? Oh my gosh. I didn't know any of this stuff. Good luck finding it online. Did you have this? Well, I mean, you could find online it if you know where is not to look. real. <laughs> yeah, and that's and it's telling people that because I actually had somebody go, "Oh, we didn't move any American troops from over there." And I was like, "I'm gonna punch you in your fucking head." It says right on my fucking DD two fourteen. <laughs> Jesus. Wait, you know, <laughs> the American public has gotten so fucking weird. Yeah. Well, that's the other thing. It's like, oh, well, if I didn't read it on online, you know, on Wikipedia or some other place, then it didn't exist. It's like, no, oh, Wikipedia fuck you. is the worst. I've been trying to research stuff for this um, spy novel I'm writing. And Wikipedia is the most useless goddamn piece of information, like uh, alleged information I've ever seen. Go, I've out, go out and buy books that were published before 2010. It That's actually exactly what I've been doing. I've been going out and I've been buying books by people who were actually there. Excellent. So, so what I'm doing, yeah. So the first, the first book, um, the protagonist was um, one of Five Commando in the Simba Revolution, and good luck finding anything about the the congo simba revolution online that doesn't oh, good have luck finding anything about the congolese wars good luck yeah that's like i spent three years fighting with wikipedia trying to get the pandemic page to actually reflect reality because one of their super users was an illiterate fuckhead and couldn't under couldn't read the cdc page right and I'd make the changes to – I'd do direct copy out the CDC pages, make the changes, and I'd come back like the next day and found out they'd, they'd reverted it. And finally, I managed to – finally, I can't remember how, but I was on some site, and one of the editors was bragging about, oh, you know, it wasn't Reddit, but it was before that because it was like, oh, ask me anything about Wikipedia. And I said, why do you have an editor that's illiterate? And mm -hmm. finally, they changed it, and the guy got pissed and got in a fight with – I think it was like one of the founders. He, was, he got in a fight with them, and it was like, no, I know how to read it, and the founder was like – that's not how it goes. It, I'm looking at the CDC page right here. You're you're not reading it right. They had the wrong information for years, and people online were using it in arguments. I mean, anytime so, anybody so cites Wikipedia to me as a source in an argument, I immediately throw their I throw their opinion in the garbage can. If you're wondering why this generation uh, and and the one after it are so fucked up, it's because we are and have been being lied to. 24 7 almost our entire lives oh 
Yeah, I don't think there's so much fucked. I don't think the majority of them are fucked up. I think it's a very loud vocal minority. I mean, I meet you know, I meet people in my daughter's generation all the time, and it's like, okay, they're not fucked up like everybody's saying. Of course, it could be because I live in the Midwest. That might be it. Yeah, all the, all the <laughs> I think it's it. Come to California. <laughs> when I lived on the West Coast, they were all fucking. What the hell's the matter with you? Well, you live in a part of the country that's like maybe about twenty minutes away from uh, witch burnings of. Uh, <laughs> Up rumors. Yeah. <laughs> I love Which that. I'm okay yes. with. Yes, yes. We're almost at witch burnings. Please don't move out here. It's terrible here. There's giant swarms of locusts. Yes, they, they, they'll eat your children. Don't move out no, here. No, no, no. If you guys actually start doing witch burnings of groomers, yeah. I want video. <laughs> <laughs> I would love, you know, I see that. You know, I think back to when I was a kid. And when I was about nine, I don't remember how old I was. I remember I was in school. I remember I'd learned how to do cursive writing. I know that, you know, we were learning all about, we were learning about the Korean War in history class. And I remember I sat next to this blonde girl who wore a scarf every day. And one of the teachers got busted for touching kids, right? And some of the parents beat this guy bloody and threw him in an empty box car oh, <laughs> down, at the, down at the rail yard and he was never seen again <laughs> good you know and sometimes i think you know maybe we ought to go back to that oh, i absolutely. think we're close yeah. i think we are very very close I you mean, know uh, crucifixions were a, a great like community building exercise you know whole town <laughs> goes out there you you see you see you know uh you see your friends you guys get to see get to see you know what people get what they fucking deserve and then you get to go home and you know it's a good day of it well you know and especially you know you know i i don't want to get too into it but i mean the fact that you know people say oh we shouldn't punish them too harshly for destroying the childhood and potentially ruining somebody for the rest of their life it was just a just a mistake and it's like just a mistake they knew what they're fucking doing you know That's they've what no mom used to say and she was mm -hmm. a teacher i hate that attitude and it's uh it's something i get really really angry about because you know my my characters and my my life in a, in a lot of ways is is so focused around this idea of uh, childhoods that have been shattered and i have absolutely no sympathy for people uh, yeah. who 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 stand up for that kind of behavior it's it's literally the worst thing a human being can do because i'll oh. tell you i remember the hippies all saying oh children are sexual creatures too oh, God. i can oh. literally remember somebody saying that degenerates like them belong on a cross <laughs> and i remember them saying that and it was like you know now looking back on it, i was like yeah thanks for screwing up like everybody in my fucking trailer park and you know yeah. this this is lifelong trauma i mean I'm, i still talk to a girl you know it's like she's like the only person i know from when i was that age and she's still fucked up in all new and hor horrific ways have you read um uh moira i can't remember what her last name yes is. it's Marion um, zimmer bradley's uh daughter oh, oh you're on uh, your recommendation cat actually it was something i read and it became um I wouldn't say a source, but it became a, a very helpful um, guide to understanding that, as was um, a presentation that uh, Stefan Molyneux did called The Bomb in the Brain, which I recommend to everybody, regardless of political affiliation, because it talks exactly about what childhood trauma does to people later in life. Yeah, and it's it's and the way you cope with it, too. Mm -hmm. I mean... But yeah, I mean, reading about what Marion Summer Bradley did, I was like, holy shit. I'll admit, I've got a strong stomach, but I had to stop reading that book because um, it was one of those things where either I was going to crawl into a little ball or I was going to find somebody to punch. So <laughs> this is just, it made me want to vomit. And, you know, and, you know, they're all like, oh, it's about power. That woman had all the power in the world. She mm -hmm. was wealthy beyond everybody's imagination. You know, she was a worldwide phenomenon. Everybody knew her name. Um, she exerted vast influence and control of the science fiction community. And, and she was the leader out. of the New Age movement. Yep. Mm -hmm. And she's pimping out three-year-olds. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's not about power. It's a, it's a sickness. You know, it's 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 a disease that people. I don't know it. Now I don't want to get too like 
I'm sorry if I'm getting political. Little, okay, I don't want to get yeah, I don't want to get too political. But at what point do we stop do do people like that give at up what, their humanity? Like at what point how You don't do you, want how, me to talk because I'm a product of a trailer park next to a junkyard and years of warfare. You don't want me to talk because <laughs> Uh, when they decide it's perfectly fine to groom kids, I think they're no longer. I mean, they, they've they've given up their right. You know, because the seventies, the you know, you want to know what's wrong with you know what want to know what's wrong with all the kids that grew up in the seventies, hippies. That's what's wrong yeah. with us. You know, the yeah. whole all children are sexual, and oh, it's never too early to explore your sexuality, good. and if it feels good, do it, man. But that's so, also why some of us hate hippies. Yeah. Oh, because yeah. we learn not to trust them. <laughs> now, I've yeah, got a fun I mean, thing to read for you. Who, me? In the late 60s, yeah. some European liberals thought to break down the sexual taboos that, were, that was a task that had been started young in German kindergartens run along left lines, uh, run, run, run along the left lines. Teachers encouraged children to fondle them, view pornography, and simulate intercourse. Uh, contemptuous accounts of the parents who felt qualms were suppressed because they were being told that's how children naturally behave. What was really happening, though, is child abuse. Anybody who talks about breaking down sexual taboos uh, molests kids. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. Weimar Germany was also ground zero. <coughs> yeah, for a lot yeah of the exactly. I was going to make that. I was going to say, and then one day, for no reason whatsoever, <laughs> Germany yeah. elected Hitler. <laughs> For no, re no reason. Well, you know, actually, that was the first group he went after. Yeah. They don't talk about that. That was the first group he went after. Mm -hmm. No, because I think everybody was kind of on his side for that part. One thing I was talking about with somebody is we were talking about, oh, you know, all these groomers, all these groomers. And I'm like, you know, you're not looking at what's going to happen. And they're like, what? I said, well, you know, in the 90s, we in the 90s and the late 80s, we jumped on anything that remotely looked like child abuse because, mm -hmm. you know we were i said but you have no idea that this is a time bomb all of these kids that are being you know taught this sex so early are going to end up with hypersexuality they're going to end up with drug and alcohol problems while they're trying to cope they're going to end up on medication it's going to screw up their morality system and nobody looks at that they're like oh it actually helps their health no it doesn't no no that's what i've been saying i i think i say this stuff all the time and everybody's just like oh why are you being such a racist what does racist. race have to do with it exactly but it's, um, you know, and I had somebody ask people, well, what makes you think you know? Because I was a teenager in the 80s. Yeah. You were a teenager and then you raised children. Because yeah, McGruff the, the time, because McGruff the crime dog was fucking more intelligent than the goddamn teachers we have now. Ugh. I mean, I yeah, no, and I, I agree. I am a teacher and I agree with you. I think <laughs> teachers right now are, are, are a disgrace. My in, in high school, before I dropped out, my science teacher used to work for NASA, and I lived in a small nowhere town. My English teach one of my English teachers was actually a poet. Um, she she was a nurse in Vietnam, and she came back and wrote poetry. And it was all very happy flower and fairy stuff because that's how she was coping. Um, when I went when I went and confronted the teachers at my daughter's school once, and I. I went in there with a set of brass knuckles <laughs> and I confronted a couple of the teachers and I found out later these people had done nothing. They had gone to college, learned to be a teacher, came back and became a teacher and were and tried to screw my kid up. Yeah, that's about right. Well, and I still fair. remember, well, I have freedom of speech in my classroom. I said, well, that's good, but we're in the parking lot now. <laughs> I'll say this much. If if pedos is just a sexual preference, then burying them is just gardening. Mm -hmm. Always remember, cover them with cover them with endangered plants so it's illegal to dig them up. <laughs> hey, I like that. Yeah, you know, and you know, you got. I try to avoid dark misery fiction. You know, somebody asked me once, you know, oh, you know, you have this background and you have these experiences. Why don't you write more about, you know, the realistic human condition and the dark stuff? Um because I'd prefer to write about stuff that makes people happy. <laughs> you, you know, you, being immersed in the dark stuff uh, for long periods of time, it's, it's rough. You know, it, it, it is not, a, it's not a healthy experience for a writer or uh, a reader. And the a trick person. is balancing it out, you know? 
you know, it, it poisons you. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, and what gets me is so many people, you know, oh, you, you should you should share with what you went through. No, it should die with me. <laughs> I'm sorry, but that's how I feel about well, some of it. You're the only one that can make that decision, and it's yours yeah. to make. It's not anyone else's. Yeah, you know, I think that I really feel bad for the, the kids growing up nowadays because they have no expectation of privacy, and everything they do has been recorded since they were babies. I mean, I did the dumbest shit. I mean, the absolute dumbest shit. And yeah, my friends can like toss it back in my face if I ever talk to them. My former friends, my relatives, if I ever talk to them, they can toss stuff in my face. You know, like the time I stood on the kitchen table and peed on my sister while she was scrubbing the floor. I was, four, <laughs> I was three. I was three and maybe she should have been watching me better. You know, they could throw that in my face. But can you imagine if my mom had recorded it and put it online for everybody in the world to see? <laughs> and now it's 40. Five, you know, forty-eight years, fifty years later, Mr. and that Blood video Thorne, is still we out see there. That you're attempting to run for president. Are you aware of this video of you peeing on your sister? Yeah, yeah. I you know, just laugh and say, "Okay." They have no expectation of privacy, and I can't imagine. I can't imagine thinking that's normal. You know, they put everything up on TikTok, they put everything up on Facebook, and what gets me is my my relatives, some of whom are older than me, put everything on Facebook, and then I watch mm -hmm. as people get younger the more intimate details they're sharing until I'm seeing 20 year olds. I mean, I do not look at some of my younger relatives stuff because I don't want to know that about them. I mean, okay, you've never parents, lived. In, parents, well, no, no, no smartphone for your kid. They get, they get a crappy burner and a game tell, boy, no internet connection. Yeah. I, I got a until friend of mine. was. I got a friend of mine who finally gets on Facebook. He's my age, right? He finally gets on Facebook because he hates computers because he worked he worked in the nuke silos, so he hates computers. And he's on Facebook, right? He was telling me about this. It just happened to him last week. He's on Facebook. You know, he's looking everybody up on Facebook, and, you know, they're saying, oh, so-and-so, is up. this is their link. This is their link, right? And he gets to his grandniece who's in her 20s, right? And what is her first post that he sees? I finally took this XXL size dragon dildo up my ass. Watch the video. Oh my lord! What kind of moron shares that? <laughs> Take a look at Facebook. Take what a look at Instagram. Is Take a look at oh my god. The Roman Empire. You know, I go by the rule of if I, you know, if it's something I don't want my boss to find, yeah, I don't post it. <laughs> he said. You know, he says. I called my niece and said, you know what your daughter's doing online? And she's like, no, my daughter's moved out. And he, he said, I said, so, you know, are you going, are you still online? He goes, you know, that computer I bought. And I was like, yeah, he goes, so I picked it up and I opened the window this time and I hucked it outside. <laughs> wow. Can you imagine that those just scrolling through your family's timeline and here's your 20 year old. 20 year old great niece shoving something the size of a thermos up her ass. <laughs> I mean, you see, I, I, I use a fake name because I was worried about people getting mad at my stories. Imagine like using your real name, your real identity with your photos linking to your social media, and just you, you have this huge footprint yeah. for people who want to hurt you. Well, remember in the '90s, we taught our kid. We tried to teach our kids never use your real name online. Exactly. Never give them any information. And with the rise of Facebook and MySpace, everybody began giving out their personal information. And it blows me away how much is up there. Do you remember how effective Stranger Danger was? <laughs> yeah, you, uh, I remember being an adult male and sitting there and watching my kids play when they were, you know, three three five and seven playing at the playground and having a group of women come over near me and one of them a bigger one comes up drifts over by me looks at me and goes do you have children here sir <laughs> and i looked at her and i said those three are mine right there and she called them over and goes is this your daddy and they're like yes and then he ran off and played i would have lost my shit if that I, happened to me i did not because they were guarding because I'm sitting there and my kids have been playing for a good hour because they were high energy and I'm watching them run around, but I'm watching three little girls 
and I've got my eyes constantly on three little girls. And I didn't lose my mind because I realized what they were doing. It was the first time I'd been to that park. Now, after I'd been going to the park you know, every weekend for six months, I actually, you know, would sit there and chat with those ladies. But at first they were like, there is a strange man watching three little girls constantly. Does anybody know him? Well, I approve of this. Yeah, that makes a little bit more sense. Yeah. We've made it too damn easy for these sickos to move about. And just to make trannies happy and what is it? Bi gender nonsense shit. But a lot of the protections that used to guard kids against that scuff have all been removed for their feelings so that we don't hurt the trannies' feelings. No, it's so they don't hurt all kinds of people's feelings. I mean, I mean, it used to be you guarded children with your fucking life. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've done disaster assistance. I mean, when I was in the service and afterwards, I did disaster service night you know i've driven trucks i've driven you know big trucks through water high enough that i had to cut the fan blade so that it didn't splash water into the into the intakes where was it and the first what where was this uh, uh washington and oregon oh okay and uh the water was so that the water was that deep. i remember every time i go to a house it would always you know what the first thing that was handed to me either a little old lady or a child or a really small child usually it was the and a lot of times it went the, the really small child the women and then the little old lady was handed to me and the and the adult male got out and we went to the truck yeah and it never failed you know it was always like that but then all of the all of society's protection for women and children were removed you know and i hear oh you know that's misogyny that women need protected and i'm like and i actually looked at somebody who told me that and i said weren't you yesterday at a rally about women deserve more protection at night and she stares at me for a minute it's like her brain blue screen to death and i said <laughs> i'm totally with you that there needs to be more policing then that women should be able to you know that the street lights need to be replaced on that avenue because there's been two rapes in the last six months in that avenue because no street lights i agree with you women need to be protected and need to be able to be safe and she's staring at me i can see her brain trying to reboot and i'm like what and she goes well, you're still a misogynist and stomps away. I'm like, wow, I agree with you that women need to be protected. And I'm a mis Then my, yeah, they, they, then my they brain blue screen. They compartmentalize their reality. In this scenario, it's this. And in this scenario, it's this. And it's like ice cube trays. You know, there's, in theory, it's separate to them until they overflow into each other. And then they don't know what to do. And the funny thing is, is guess how they caught the rapist? They put the lights back on the avenue, and they caught him shooting him out with a silenced twenty-two pistol. Shooting the lights out? Jeez. Yeah. Yeah. Turned out that he was the guy who was doing them. Well, isn't that interesting? Yeah. Wow. Who would have thought that he would have needed less light so he could rat pack some woman and drag her in a fucking alley? Well, you know, the most vulnerable members of society are always the ones that are are the, the least able to defend themselves, children, the elderly. Mm -hmm. And huh. predators will always seek out those people first because they're so indefensible. And the people who do take advantage of weak uh, people, young people, old people, you know, that's that's just... It makes it makes you feel so sick because yeah. mm. I got a friend of mine who's a big time liberal. She's a big time liberal, and I love her to death. And she she actually told me the reason why I'm so big on defending women and children, and the elderly, is because of all the time I spent in war zones. And I was like, "What?" And she goes, "Well, you've always seen the catastrophe happening to them. You've always seen it, and your instinct is, you know, not to let them get shot in the face." And I'm like, "Well, yeah, they're civilians." And she goes, "Right." <laughs> She, you know, she said that that's where my instinct comes from, and it blows me away how few people have that anymore. I mean, very true. And I, I, I can't figure out what the hell happened. Actually, I know what happened. Media happened. You know, and it makes me upset. That's like, uh, what was it? Three years ago, there was a huge thread. I think it was on Reddit. Um, it was just this massive thread. No, it was before that. It was like seven years ago. God, I'm old. <laughs> I think 20 years ago, I think the 90s. But uh, anyway, it was this big thing about these women were all shocked at how strong their boyfriends were. 
And they're like, oh, I was wrestling with him, and I got him in a chokehold, and he told me, stop choking me. And he just pulled my arm away like it was nothing. And, you know, it was all these women were talking about, oh, I didn't know how strong my boyfriend was. I didn't know how strong my husband was. And I was like, are you fucking serious? <laughs> no. Um, when uh, I was younger, uh, my mom uh, got me enrolled in a uh, women's self-defense course. Yes, I did learn some things, but part of it was – trying to get women to psychologically believe that they could overpower a man. And um, yeah, that's not really reality. Uh, and the thing is, is my mom was in the very first class of this self-defense course back in the early 90s, where they were like, no, you're not going to overpower your attacker. The point is to get the fuck away. <laughs> and when I took it, they changed it to, oh, yeah, you can totally overpower him. Huh. So, yeah. See, I, I was running around with, you know, there. See, I always had this thing, and, you know, I get, <laughs> I get shit, I get shit all the time because I'm like, no, women don't have the same endurance and they don't have the same strength as men. And I had somebody trying to tell me, I, now I used to run marathons. You know, I've mentioned before that I ran, I used to run every weekend 10 miles with a midget on my back. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was my idea of a fun time. <laughs> and I had somebody claiming at this writer's board I was on that women actually are better at long distance running than men. And I was like, are you fucking crazy? No. And they went, oh, well, the records show that when you get past about 10, 15 miles, women actually finished faster than men. I'm like, are you fucking crazy? I need some sources. And they're like, oh, I can't be bothered to look it up. You need to educate yourself. I said, well, okay, here's the education from the sites I'm on. And I, re and I reposted the times for the for the 10, for the 10, 20, 30, 50, 100, 500, 1,000, and then cross you at cross the United States runs. And I'm like, running from New York to LA, the difference is four days. And they were like, oh, I meant on average. I was like, no, no. Uh, Trenton, <laughs> yeah. uh, Trenton Arnie asked a really good question in the comments. Have you ever seen somebody with PTSD become uh, the monster as a way uh, to cope? Of, of course, yes. Um, yeah. in, in when I was teaching, um, you know, there were kids that had been uh, abused that would pick on others and hurt them. And, you know, I've, I've encountered um, stories of, of, of people who've been, um, you know, uh, molested at home. So they, you know, molest somebody else. It's, it's a cycle uh -huh. of, 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 of bad, bad shit and it and it'll break your heart for sure it's, if you see it it's easy to become the monster if you're not careful and if you've got people around you enabling it it's even easier um it's really easy to become a monster if you have ptsd and the fucked up thing is nowadays there's more of a culture of you know accepting you for yourself you know and it's like well you know oh you're perfect just the way you are no perfect is a goal not a location <laughs> it's an ideal not a place and yeah i've seen people turn into monsters i've seen people oh, jesus i've seen people destroy themselves destroy their families destroy everything around them some of them couldn't stop themselves for other people it was just easier i mean it's fucking terrible Anyway, let's do another question. Let's okay. do another question. I'm thinking about something else. Um, I, I, I've actually got to go to bed, guys. Sorry. Oh, uh, I, have, actually, I have work in a couple hours. Oh, wow. Oh, oh wow. shoot. It's 9 o'clock. Or 9.20, I should say. At least for me. Mm. So, okay. It's not, it's not that late. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I got to work, too. Yeah. And uh, Ishii, uh, Ishii has turned into a pumpkin, actually. Yeah. So. I turned. I I, didn't get, I took a nap and didn't wake up until like three minutes before I logged in. <laughs> I saw I had an email flashing. Well, um, do we still have things to talk about for in episode three? Um. Well, you know, it, I I feel like we've kind of uh, passed the point of talking about, you know, PTSD and moved into the point of talking about just like the, the dreadful. Life. The dreadful black heart of, of modern society. Actually, I think that is a good topic, though, because, um, you know, again, there's so many people that write uh, the darkness of humanity and 
it comes off as goofy or over the top or stupid. Um, so I, uh, unless uh, you two say otherwise, I do think that uh, continuing this next week would be a great idea. Sounds good to me. Sounds good to me. Um, I mean, I, I won't get too dark. I won't get too dark because I was deployed to Africa three times. So I won't get too dark. Uh, only as dark as you want to get. That's perfectly fine. <laughs> I mean, you don't me, have to go medium well. <laughs> no, nobody wants to know what the world is really like. <laughs> you know what? I agree. <laughs> <coughs> I do actually agree. <laughs> but all right. So where can people in the chat and people listening to the show find you two? Uh, go first. Okay, yeah, uh, you can find my stuff on Reddit or Royal Road. Just look up First Contact. If you're looking on Amazon, it's under Behold Humanity. And no, there is no modern politics. There is no modern anything in my books. It is not misery porn. I am not trying to educate you. I am not trying to convince you. And I'm not trying to tell you that my worldviews are the correct way to view the world. It is sci-fi. It is escapism. I started it to help people deal with COVID lockdowns, and I'm still writing it to help us deal with these dark times because life is tough, times are hard, and nobody got a Christmas card. Uh, you can find me on Amazon, uh, William, William Hastings. Uh, I uh, have two books out that can be uh, bought with two more on the way before the year is up. Um, they are... Uh, Pretty different from each other. One of them is the one I've been talking about, Vagabond Legacy, a very um, dark but very fulfilling uh, character journey, uh, young adult fantasy, really meaty story, 450 pages, uh, good stuff. And the other one is Vatican Championship Wrestling, which is just fun, action, uh, cool, supernatural stuff. Uh, and it's it's just 125. It's a real quick read. So both of those are on uh, Amazon, and they're also on Audible. Uh, VCW is read by Matt Raywalt, formerly known as Aiden English of the WWE, and The Crimson Spark is read by Vic Mignana. And both of those productions are wild, wonderful uh, little trips that uh, I was really impressed with, and they made me experience the story in a whole new light, and I recommend you check those out. And if you want to get on my mailing list, I'm on uh, TGR Press. That's TGRPress.org. Uh, it is... Um, free to sign up and you'll get all the uh all the updates about uh, my nonsense as it goes excellent and uh both of them their links are in the description below along with ishi's books you can get them on amazon and at zero one publishing.com and for those of you who are in the phoenix area we are going to be at phoenix fan con not this weekend but next weekend so if you're in town we would love to see you and thank you everyone for joining us this evening and uh, tune in next week where we will continue the conversation Good night, everybody. Thank you very much.